This is the new Phoenix 7 Pro series, which adds a slate of hardware enhancements as well as a number of new software features. As you can see right there, one of the most requested features is the flashlight on all the models. But before we get to all that newness, understand that I've been putting these units through their paces over the last little while. Everything from doing an Ironman 70.3 race this past weekend, to going ahead doing an epic crazy hike along the coastline yesterday, and plenty of other daily more mundane training over the last little while. Atop that, my wife has been putting the smaller Phoenix 7 Pro series unit right there through her training over the last little while as well. Now the very first thing to know is the pricing. As you can see here on this screen there is a ton of different model options. Essentially though the price has gone up by a hundred bucks for those base models. They are now $7.99 versus the previous $6.99 though they include more hardware features than the past. This is notable because the also just released today Epix Pro series did not actually see a price increase. Those units stayed the same price across the board, but added more hardware features. And the other thing you notice is that all models of the Phoenix 7 Pro series are now solar enabled. There's no longer some non-solar models. Instead, you just have essentially solar and then you have the Sapphire editions. And we'll get to some of the differences a little bit later on, but the core thing now is that all the units do have multi-band GPS and all of them have the same amount of 32 gigs of storage. Whereas in the past, those base units did not have that. Now, as I mentioned just a moment ago, the Epic series was announced today as well. And I've got an entire video on that up in the corner there, a full review that goes into all of those features, because there are some features on that that are not on these watches here. Now, the most obvious new feature is the one you see you turned on right there, which is the flashlight. Uh, this was something introduced on the Phoenix 7X series about a year and a half ago. And now it's on all models of the Phoenix, as well as all models of the Epix. You can access the flashlight by simply double tapping this upper right hand button like this, and it turns it on or off. Now you can see the flashlight right there. There's two white lights and one red light. I can also go ahead and long hold this upper left hand button, go to the flashlight, there we go, and I can control whether it's in red light mode. So I can turn on red light mode and go up increase the brightness there. The brightness level in the white light mode is roughly equivalent to my iPhone flashlight. So it's plenty bright to illuminate a room or whatever the heck I want it to do. The red light mode though is super useful just in the middle of the night, getting around a hotel room or a house, wherever the case is, without being overly glaringly bright. In addition, the flashlight mode on all the Garmin watches also can lock into your running cadence. So it can actually blink like a strobe light if you want to uh, while you're running or even as like an emergency strobe as well. It's one of those features that sounds like, you know, super gadgety nerdy, but practically speaking, it's just super useful. Now, turning these off real quick here. There we go, boom, boom. We'll flip it over and see a different kind of light that's also new on the Phoenix 7 Pro series, which is the optical heart rate sensor. Uh, as you can see there, it looks quite different than in the past. Uh, what Garmin's done is they've spread out the LEDs on the back there to basically give a broader projection of those light LEDs into your skin. Garmin says that'll help in sports or workouts that have kind of heavy wrist movements, so things like weightlifting and stuff like that. Uh, the reason for that is that when you twist your wrist, light can get in underneath the sensor. Uh, in outside light, like daylight and things like that, our optical sensors like worst arch nemesis, at least from an accuracy standpoint. And I'll dive into the accuracy later on in this review, so not to spoil that too much, but this is by far the best optical sensor that Garmin has made to date. Now you may be wondering whether or not this optical sensor is also going to do ECG, or electrocardiogram. That's something that Garmin introduced on their Venue 2 Plus series a couple months ago. And the answer to that is a little bit uh, complicated. And the reason is that Companies in the US cannot go ahead and declare something as an ECG device, which is a medical grade device, until it's been certified. If they declare that happens before they get certified, they get in big trouble with the FDA and generally big companies tend to want to avoid that. So when I asked Garmin whether or not this was an ECG capable device, they tiptoed around that a little bit. Uh, they noted that at this point in time, this is not an ECG capable device. And they make absolutely zero promises whatsoever about whether it might be down the road. However, there are a couple signs that indicate that it probably will be. Uh, the very first one is if we look at the sensor itself, we can see it has the exact same isolation ring that the Venue 2 Plus does, uh, which is there purely and wholly for ECG. It basically isolates the metal portion of the back plate from the sensor. The second way we know this is probably coming at some point is just the way Garmin answered the question. When I've asked the same question about other watches released recently, uh, they always gave a very hard no, there's no ECG hardware in that particular watch. Whereas when I asked in this case, they said there's simply no ECG functionality enabled at this point in time on this watch. And that was kind of like the end of that particular conversation as far as whether or not there'll be ECG in the future or ever or anything like that. So don't like buy this watch for something that may or might not ever exist. Next, Garmin says you're 
using a new generation display on the Phoenix 7 Pro. I've got the two side by side here, the Phoenix 7 Pro and the uh, Phoenix 7 Original. These are both Sapphire Solar Editions, so you can kind of see the like for like. And Garmin says there's two different things at play here. Uh, the first is the new pixel design, which should improve indoor readability, they're saying, as well as higher contrast, increased color saturation, and luminous. Uh, and I think that's generally kind of true. It's sort of hard to see, but you can see this a little bit sharper here, a little bit clearer. The bigger item, though, is a new backlight design, and that's much more visible. These are both set for 20% right now. Uh, and you can see this is far brighter and far crispier than this one over here. However, there's one thing to be aware of. On the Phoenix 7 Pro, there's a new setting under display, or backlight, sorry, uh, called auto backlight. Uh, by default, this is on, uh, and I found that when this is on by default, the display looks frankly horrible. The backlight is never bright enough. It's never quite good. Uh, I turn that off and it's much, much better. and doesn't seem to have any major impact on battery life. Now, what Garmin's actually doing here is also new. They're leveraging that solar ring around the outside to measure light. Uh, and in theory, this sounds really cool and it works well outdoors, but inside in dimmer conditions, I find it doesn't work very well at all, leading to kind of the backlight wonkiness with that setting. The good news is you can turn it off, so it's not too big of a deal. Next up are the battery stats. That's probably why you would get a Phoenix unit over the Epics, it's just the longer battery lifetimes. Though, as you can see, those have even shifted even more with the Epic series getting bigger battery lifetimes in the past. Uh, still, these numbers here are basically align with what I'm getting in my real world usage, uh, both from an activity standpoint as well as a day to day standpoint. Next up, Garmin has added multi band or dual frequency GPS to all of the Phoenix 7 Pro units. In the past, it was only the Solar Sapphire editions that had multi-band or dual frequency GPS, uh, which is basically a mode of GPS that is kind of like the holy grail of GPS accuracy. It allows you to get great GPS coverage, even in these overhang cliff scenarios like you see right here from yesterday, where like more than half of the sky is blocked, uh, I still got near perfect tracks underneath that. Again, that's now included in all models as opposed to the past uh, being only the more expensive models. From here, we're going to move into some of the software features before rounding back into the hardware side. Uh, the first one is a new feature called Endurance Score. If I go down here, you'll see Endurance Score listed uh, right there. Endurance Score is basically looking at all of my activities and giving me an overall score for those activities that's mostly weighted to the duration of those activities, or the length of those particular activities. Uh, so the idea here is that it does a better job at tracking this than something like Acute Load might. And in particular, it does it across all sport types. So in the past, something like Acute Load would not have worked very well with like ice skating, like long distance going a long ways type ice skating. Uh, that wouldn't have done very well here, but now this handles that better. The the idea being with endurance score that doesn't really care what sport you are uh, as long as you're just doing a whole lot of it. Garmin says that from an overall scoring standpoint, if they look at like a top end, uh, you know, world class triathlete doing a Ironman training, they're probably like hovering around or just underneath 12,000 or so in the upper 11s or something like that. Uh, in my case, I'm at about 81, 8,200, somewhere in that range. Uh, my wife is a little bit higher right now. Uh, she's been up at 9,100 recently. Uh, recovery week right now, a week or two, uh, down to like 8,700. And again, the idea here is that you could compare these and you could see that in her case, she's doing more training than me right now, and thus she has a higher score. And that's something you couldn't have done very well with either VO2 max or with acute load because those vary on a lot of different parameters. VO2 max is still taken into account here, uh, but it's not something as important as just like the overall raw quantity of your training load. Still, I've seen some weird quirks with this score, uh, in particular cases where I go out for a couple hour ride and the number only increments like one or two units, like, you know, from 8155, 8156. And then I've gone out for a really easy, like silly easy, like almost backstroking across the water sort of swim uh, for half an hour and it incremented by like 50 units. And some of the stuff doesn't quite seem to line up. And, and broadly speaking, it does, but there's just some like weird day-to-day -day quirks that I think still need to be sorted out. Speaking of which, there's the next item, which is the hill score. Uh, so if I look at this here, you see hill score. Uh, and this is a score based on how well I go up hills. Uh, and the score has two different components of it. Uh, the first piece though is my overall score, uh, which is at 77 right now on a scale of zero to 100. And my overall elevation gain, which is 4,899 meters or roughly 16,000 feet over the last uh, 28 days. If I go down, I see it's broken out into two components, hill endurance and hill strength. Hill endurance is all about like how long I'm going up a hill uh, and how much elevation gain I get. Basically just like go big, go long versus hill strength is about how fast I go up a hill. Uh, and they're kind of two different components. Somebody can be really good at going up steep hills uh, at a very fast pace and somebody can be really good at just just holding it on for a long, long time. I kind of fall in that first camp there where I can just hold on for a really long time uh, versus some people are more in the second camp. 
Uh, down below you have VO2 max shown as well. Now this score takes about two weeks to show up and it'll decay then over time if you're not uh, basically doing hill workouts. So about three weeks ago, I did a uh, basically a hike that I went from the sea all the way to the top of an 8,000 foot mountain in one go, one day. It was like 35, 40 K, something like that. It took about eight hours. Uh, and that popped my hill score climb like it introduced my hill score climb in one go uh, to about 85, I think it was. And well, that sounds awesome. And I appreciate like that, you know, that uh, gift there. I don't think that should be right. I'm not a pro level ultra runner. I live in a pancake flat place. Uh, and for the most part, my hill score is basically like four major runs, an 8,000 foot one, a 5,000 foot one, and a couple of couple thousand foot ones. Uh, and that's it. Versus a pro level athlete, having you know, a score in the 90s or something, I would think there'd be a huge difference between them and me. Garmin isn't super sure as to why my score got so high. It probably is due to the fact that 8,000 foot mountain, which I know sounds impressive, but again, there should be a very clear difference between me and a world-class athlete that runs in mountains every single day. And so like the endurance score, the jury is still out for me on this. I'm interested to see how other people, this works for other people, uh, especially as they start getting those initial numbers populated. Next, we got a slate of quick features that are pretty easy to run through. Uh, the first one is weather overlays. You can now go into the widget wall and you can see under the weather widget, uh, basically overlays of the conditions nearby. In particular, you're gonna see your precipitation, temperature, wind, and clouds. All those like time overlays that show uh, how those clouds or that rainstorm moves through the area over the course of a short period of time. You can move the map around and see with different conditions. All this does require the phone beyond you though, so it goes ahead and has access to that data. The one minor slash moderate slash pretty big massive oversight though is that you can't actually show these weather overlays while navigating on your map during any sort of sport activity. You can access the widgets back in the main menu, uh, but doing that has other weird complications and bugs with it right now. So hopefully, though Garmin like sorts that out, I don't think it should be a big jump to be able to add that weather overlay during a workout, uh, during a hike, or any sort of navigation. And it sounds like Garmin understands that, so hopefully we'll see that again down the road at some point. Next is another mapping item, which is Garmin has added shaded relief to all of their topo active maps, which is all the maps that you get in these units. Uh, you can see kind of side by side here how this looks. It comes now as default and turned on, and it's basically part of the maps that you download. This makes it just a little bit easier to see the train and the topography uh, versus just the straight lines on a topo map. Next, Garmin has added some 30 plus different sport or activity profiles to the watch. I put them on the screen right now here. This marks a pretty big shift in the way Garmin does sport and activity profiles. Up until now, Garmin has mostly created sport profiles when they had data behind it, meaning they gone ahead and had metrics for some particular thing. For example, if you were water skiing, it would show you, you know, your max speed per water skiing run and how many runs you did and all that fun stuff automatically categorized and figured out smartly. And the same true for skiing or mountain biking and lots of different data metrics. But what they didn't have is some sport profiles for things without those fancy metrics versus a lot of their competitors had these sport profiles for all sorts of sports without any fancy metrics behind them. And that's really useful when you just want to categorize what you're doing. So things like ice skating or basketball or baseball, whatever the case may be, and you want to look on the app later on and see how much time you spent. So Garmin is adding a bunch of new sport profiles that don't necessarily have a ton of fancy data metrics behind them, but are just useful for categorize what activities you're doing. And then from there, Garmin says, to look at the usage of those different sport profiles, figure out ones that people are using more often than others, and then look to build up the data behind those, like some of their more fancy sport activity profiles. And since we're talking about data, there's a couple of new data pages. Uh, the first is a new split data page that basically shows your map on one side, and your data metrics of choice on another side. And then after that, there's a new perimeter-based data page that shows you essentially data fields around the outside edge uh, and then the map in the middle. The other new thing is there's been some slight user interface changes here and there. Uh, for example, you see a new recent menu. If I long hold this right button right there, it'll now show me my recently used widgets. And I can tap into these to go straight to it. So for example, endurance score, I can go straight to that widget. This is accessible across the watch in any mode, whether it be sport mode or non-sport mode, and it's handy just to get back to certain things. Also handy to get back to the weather overlay page because again, it's not in the sport mode setting. So I guess that's one way of doing it, but it's just kind of cumbersome. Now, if you're an existing Phoenix or Epix owner wondering whether or not these new features will come to those watches, the simple answer is yes, or mostly yes anyways. Garmin says those two units should basically remain more or less clumped together from a feature standpoint. Obviously, there's some hardware elements like the flashlight and stuff like that that will differentiate them, but uh, from an overall feature standpoint, those should remain the same as long as the hardware permits it. In any case, as I mentioned earlier on, one thing that's new across the board is 32 gigs of storage for everything that you can use for music, but also for maps. 
As a general rule of thumb, most region maps are like 8 to 11, 12 gigs or so uh, gigabytes, which means that whether it's North America or parts of Europe or the whole of Europe, uh, you're looking at probably like two, maybe even three uh, different map regions at once. You can download map regions either via Wi-Fi directly from the watch, or you can connect it to your computer uh, via the USB cable and go ahead and download that way. Still, all the maps are free globally, so you can download whatever you want. That's the full Topo Active maps. They're easy to use, and it just kind of works pretty well. Now, if you want more details on all this stuff, I've got my full user guides that'll be linked up in the corner there, or at least they'll be very, very shortly. Now, before we talk about whether or not this is a worthy upgrade, let's jump into the accuracy of the GPS, the heart rate, the elevation, and the battery life, and see how that looks over a longer period of workouts. So starting off on a bit of an easier route here, uh, the Epix and the Phoenix Pro, both of them were great spot on. Uh, note here, you can really see the difference between Garmin's multiband configuration and uh, Koros's with the multiband there, where it's just going off all over the place. Uh, as far as the heart rate, these were both exactly the same compared to the chest strap, very, very good. Even if I look at some hard intervals, like this session right here, a little bit of latency on the first two intervals, but other than that, the final intervals were pretty good. Uh, if I look at that hike that I did up in the mountains, uh, here you can see it's spot on the track back and forth. Uh, and this is some pretty complex terrain. Here's what that exact same spot looks like in the satellite view. Uh, and then here, by the way, is that overhang. The Garmin's were much better than the both Sunto and Vertex in terms of accuracy there, uh, but all of them are very very close. If I look at the elevation plot, again, spot on here, no real concerns. Now looking at the Ironman race, everything is pretty much exactly where I expected. In fact, actually outperforming the Edge 840 in one little section, but by and large, it's pretty much the same. If I look at the swim there, you can see it looks perfect. Like it's really, really crispy across the board. And the heart rate here from the bike, despite being on kind of bumpy roads with rain and descending and all that kind of stuff, isn't too bad. It's not great, but it's not too bad. Whereas if I look a little more traditional bike ride, this is the gravel bike ride that I did the other day. You can see here the Jeep GPS tracks are really, really sharp. Even in the woods, no problems at all. They're uh, pretty much right on uh, beating the crew to bike GPS unit. And the heart rate is exceptionally good here across the board, only kind of varying in a couple minor scenarios uh, where I was drifting or coasting downhill. Battery-wise, the Epics and the Phoenix Pro were surprisingly similar. For example, that six and a half hour hike, uh, basically almost both of them are about 50 hours burn rate, meaning the last 50 hours. This is full navigation, all the things turned on. And then here on the Ironman race, uh, both of these were trending towards about 45 hours hours for both units, again with all sensors connected. And the only case where I saw them slightly different was on this gravel bike ride here, where the Phoenix about 56 hours and the Epix about 39 hours, likely because it was very sunny out and I had some solar gains on the Phoenix 7 Pro Solar. Okay, so where do we stand overall? Well, it depends on what watch you're coming from. If you already have a Phoenix 7 Series watch, it's probably not worth the upgrade unless you really want the flashlight on the smaller units. Obviously, the Phoenix 7X uh, non-pro had the flashlight in it, and now it's in the other two units. For the most part, all the other features are coming as a software upgrade to you anyways on a Phoenix 7 watch. Of course, if you bought one of the non-Sapphire Phoenix 7s, uh, then you would now gain multi-band GPS across the board. The Garmin's Phoenix 7 base editions had pretty great GPS performance. And the same is true for the optical heart rate sensor. You gain a little bit more accuracy in certain activities there as well with this. If though you're coming from a Phoenix 6 series or Phoenix 5 or something else before that, uh, these are a pretty substantial bump in the features. In my mind, this release was almost more about the Epic series watches being that bigger like pop because there's now three sizes of them, there's now flashlight in them, uh, they have even bigger battery life and all that kind of stuff than it is really about the Phoenix 7. This is just sort of like maintaining parity across the board. In any case, these are great watches. They've been working well for me as well as my wife. I have no major complaints about them. With that, there's plenty more sports tech geekery coming over the next uh, couple weeks or so. So definitely stay tuned for all that. As usual, if you found this video interesting and useful, just whack that like button at the bottom there or subscribe for all that geekery to come. Have a good one.